Okay, so <coughs> as already said, the <coughs> sorry, the risks are uh, aimed at developing um, a surveillance framework for the design and evaluation of surveillance itself. And these frameworks need to be based upon um, some background information. Therefore, we informed it with uh, the results of literature reviews and with the aforementioned mapping exercise that was already presented. But we also identified uh, a third um, uh, item needed to inform it, which is a review of the surveillance system currently present in Europe. And the goal of this task was to uh, describe how animal health surveillance is currently carried out in some, uh, some uh, European countries, paying attention at the basic epidemiological characteristics, such as, for example, the population coverage or the design prevalence, and to possibly detect any variation in legislation. And this is going to complement uh, the mapping exercise with a narrower uh, focus, but a higher level of detail. In fact, the, the search has been restricted to 26 hazards that have been selected because they were present in Europe in the last 10 years. There, uh, there was available surveillance data in the investigated countries. Um, because they could have been potential case studies for any of the risks or work packages. And the data was collected by the same um, surveillance partners mentioned before and referred to the year 2011. So we ended up with 26 variables already collected for the previous task and 23 additional ones. And the additional ones include, for example, um, the hazard situation in the country or whether there were input or output based standards or the number of herd animal samples scheduled to be collected and the one currently collected. And <coughs> so the results of this uh, review uh, lie behind this curtain but I'm not going to show them. What I'm going to show you are some lessons that we learned from this exercise. So the first lesson is that information on surveillance activities is not easily accessible and sometimes not even available. So from a, um, from a survey that we performed after the data collection to uh, investigate the workload that was needed to accomplish this task, uh, it emerged that in the Parnan Institute, um, uh, Often, more than two people were needed to find sources and to extract data, and at least one to do the data entry and the review the database. And when the sources were not readily available, then there was a need for finding additional information uh, by contacting key knowledgeable persons. And those contacts happen, uh, happen more often uh, within the public sector being possibly those like personal contacts of the researcher in charge of data collection, but a uh, great variation occurred between uh, institutes. And speaking about variation, uh, we ended up with three different level of details in our data. So the first and most complete level of detail happened in what we call validation countries, the yellow one. Uh, those are countries hosting the risk or partner institutes in charge of this review. So in this case, a lot of effort, efforts have been made to retrieve the required information. And this can be interpreted as what surveillance information is available in your country if you really try hard to find it. Then we have the, the second level of detail is the, we call the collection countries, where those hosting risks or partners providing, helping in providing data, but with no other involvement in the review itself. And in this case, contacts have been exploited sometimes to uh, find additional information, but to a much lesser extent. So this reflects what information on surveillance is available in your country if you know where to look. And the last level of detail happened in the two non-partner countries. So we didn't have anyone there collecting data for us. So people from two of the partner institutes look at publicly available information and try to find the information that we needed. So this reflects what information is basically publicly available. And then we asked to the data collectors to judge how available the data was. 
And it, it emerged that design results and cost of surveillance are not very easy to find and probably they're not even available sometimes. And there seems to be a lack of consistency, transparency and open access of this information. But uh, in both the public and the private sector. But again, uh, variation occurred between institutes. And this is both due to the different uh, engagement of the data collectors, but also to the availability of the data itself, especially when it comes to country where you don't have contacts, you just have to rely on public information. The second lesson that we learn is that uh, data uh, is influenced by the data collector, which is, which seems obvious, of course, but we learn to keep it in mind now. And so having so many people uh, helping in data collection, we expect it to have some degree of inconsistency in the data. And therefore we uh, perform two level of data validation. The first we call uh, the vertical validation, where we check that related variable, uh, had, variable had consistent values in them. So for example, if the species under surveillance was wildlife, we checked that um, um, the observational unit was uh, animal and not herd. And then we perform the horizontal validation. So we split the data by hazard and we check that uh, the consistency um, between countries. And so for example, the same components in two different countries having the same hazard situation should have had the same surveillance goal. Uh, <coughs> so the highest adjustment happened for those variables related to risk-based surveillance and risk-based sampling, both because those topics had the highest level of rules agreed during the um, consistency checks, but also because those left uh, more room for personal interpretation, which comes to the next lesson which is that even known terms may uh, lead to different interpretations. So if we go, for example, for the definition of active, passive and enhanced passive surveillance, they seem pretty clear. So active surveillance is the collection of data, which is uh, promoted and decided and guided by the investigator. And then passive surveillance is the provision of animal health data, which is observed and then is the, the decision uh, rely on the data provider. And then enhanced passive, which is again this observed initiated provision, but with an active um, involvement of the investigator. So this seems clear, but there are some instances where you wonder which of the three you are going to apply, especially the last two, the differences between passive and enhanced passive. So since this and other terminology related topics seems to generate some misunderstandings, we, mm, we performed an expert opinion on some uh, terminology issues. So when we ask to the expert which actions can turn a passive surveillance component into an enhanced passive one, um, they agree that the payment of the rewards and training may act as um, enhancements, uh, the first being uh, like a financial incentive to report and the second increasing the ability to recognize symptoms and also the awareness to report. But then for all the other actions there was no consensus among the experts and especially when it comes to legal requirements uh, which can be either the uh, obligation to notify diseases or the, like the legal requirement of a minimum number of samples to be collected through passive surveillance, or the obligation to carry out like diagnosis of exclusion in certain cases. So those actions are meant to increase the likelihood of, um, of um, reporting, but they can turn the opposite way depending on the consequences of reporting. So this is still an open question. And another tricky example is uh, whether passive surveillance can be defined as risk-based. And by risk-based, by risk-based something, I mean that it focuses on the preferential sampling of the units at higher risk. So one can say, yes, it can. Uh, I mean, it focuses on sick and dead animals. They are 
I mean, the units are more likely to be infected, so it, it's risk-based. But then you can also think, okay, I'm not going to decide anything about the sampling itself. I don't have control over the sampling. I don't decide which units to be sampled, and there's no any active risk assessment involved. So this is another tricky open question. And the last lesson I'm going to tell you is that output-based standards are rarely used uh, so far in Europe. And just a bit of background, uh, input-based standards are those prescribing uh, what surveillance actions you should do to achieve a goal. And it was the first attempt to standardize surveillance in Europe because by applying the same sampling strategy, sample size, laboratory tests, and sampling frequency, you can obtain comparable results under the assumptions that the population of herds are homogeneous. And if you do the same surveillance input, you can get the same output. However, uh, the herds are not homogeneous, especially when it comes to different countries. And apply by applying output input-based standards, you might end up with an inefficient uh, surveillance strategy. Therefore, output-based standards have been proposed, and those are the one prescribing you just what you have to achieve, and then it's up to you how to go there. So they will leave you much more flexibility in the um, design of the surveillance and the choice of the test and the framework that you want to sample. And but from, um, from this um, survey, uh, it emerged that the last majority of surveillance component in the country we investigated are still input-based, and only a few amount are output-based. And two uh, extreme examples are surveillance for BSE, which is 100% input-based, and surveillance for avian influenza, which was associated to the highest number of components with uh, output-based standards. And surveillance for BSE was the first attempt in Europe to apply input-based standards. And despite, during the year, several authors uh, proposed to change it in order to, to take into account the heterogeneity. It seems that this was not the case, so it's still going in his input-based uh, standard way. And surveillance for avian influenza um, ended up at the, the one with the, the most uh, component with output-based standards, both because uh, some countries disaggregated surveillance components for avian influenza at the species level, so increasing the overall number of components compared to other countries, but also because the legislation actually allows for having output-based standards for this disease. Uh, so, in summary, what we learned from this exercise is that uh, the design and the achievement of surveillance in Europe are not well documented. And even if we put a lot of efforts in trying to find this information, uh, the lack of standardization in the, in the reporting may result in hard comparison between countries. So details on the extent and the design will be very important to share, not only to allow this comparison, but also to provide an overview, for example, the public and private surveillance efforts, or to estimate uh, the risk for the disease, or even to let us learn from experience. And output-based standards uh, have been endorsed over recent years because they allow for flexibility, but it seems that legalization uh, has not widely promoted them yet, and there might be a lot of reason for that. I'm just trying to guess a few of them. So it might be that there is a lack of expertise in implementing uh, surveillance to aiming to reach a goal with, with no guide to um, implement it, or there might be a lack of evaluation tools capable of comparing different surveillance designs, or there might be the fear that trading partners might not accept this unusual approach. But anyway, if we want to go towards output-based standards, it's very important that th we have a transparent and consistent information sharing on, on the design and the achievement of the surveillance activities that we are conducting in our countries. So potential way forwards are, well, towards transparency, uh, 
from Risk Sur experience, we learned that it would be very important to share information about surveillance designs, um, the populations surveyed, and also the um, number of animals tested or, and also test results. And to uh, enhance this, trans uh, this sorry, um, um, easy of access, uh, for example, the EU website could provide like external links to national reports, make it easier to find surveillance information if you look from another country, for example. And as for consistency, well, we should use, try to use like reporting standards or templates. And to this regard, from Risk Tour, we developed a, a framework to design surveillance and document surveillance systems. This will be the topic of the next uh, talk. And this is all. Thank you.